So this is one of our School of Security Studies New Voices uh, seminar series. And yeah, we're really proud um, that we've been able to, to roll this out again this year. Um, the aim is really just, I think, you know, to showcase the diversity and the breadth of the research and the scholarship that's taking place across the school and to give early career researchers an opportunity um, to, to showcase their work, to get some feedback um, and just to, um, yeah, to, to really uh, talk about talk about their research um, and have hopefully a, a, a good conversation. So um, we've got two speakers today. So we've got um, Pauline Heinrich. Pauline is a lecturer in war studies um, whose research focuses around international climate diplomacy um, and the contestation of state security narratives um, in the context of, of climate change. Uh, Pauline's worked with and led international teams in conflict and post-conflict countries uh, including the Ukraine and the Baltic states. Um, she's been selected as an emerging scholar by the Milton Wolf Seminar on Public Diplomacy. Received, she received her Master's in International Security from Sciences Po in Paris and her PhD from Royal Holloway uh, in London. Uh, and Rhiannon M is, um, is here, is a third year PhD candidate in the Department of War Studies. So all this information is correct. Um, She's also the review articles editor for Millennium, the Journal of International Studies, and her work engages with ideas of um, really of home in, in a global context and the interactions with sovereignty, state and nation. Um, so uh, Rhiannon gained her BA in international relations and her MA in international conflict studies from King's um, and is looking forward to completing the whole set, <laughs> as you put. So um, over to you in terms of who would like to go first. So we said around 15 minutes. Um, and then about 10 for per speaker and then about 10 minutes for, for, the, for the discussants um, and then hopefully although we are going to be just running a little bit late we'll have some time for for questions and conversations so over to you You're very warm welcome okay, thanks everyone for making it down here um, I'm going to be talking about um, a specific bit of my PhD research which um, as a general project focuses on as Stephen said the role of home and international relations which has been kind of overlooked um, both, I think, from um, a more traditional and a more critical perspective. It tends to be something we talk about without ever explaining. Um, and I think that that warrants investigation, right? I think we should try to explain home. Um, so I'm gonna talk about home as a challenge to contemporary sovereignty um, and the state system actually. Um, and I'm gonna do that through the case study of the Chagos Islanders. So. Uh, not many people have heard of the Chagos Islands. Um, they are officially known as the British Indian Ocean Territory. They are here. Um, it's a group of seven atolls, uh, one of which is called Diego Garcia, which is used as a US military base um, and has been implicated in extraordinary rendition. You might think that that's what makes these islands kind of internationally interesting. And I think that does make them internationally interesting. But I'm going to say that um, it's something else that makes them of key importance for me. So. The question of how the islands were cleared to create this military base um, has received kind of relatively little attention. It's kind of increasing, but it's um, there's not been loads of work on it. So more than 1,000 Chagotians were forcibly removed from the islands over six years, um, able to take very few possessions. Their dogs were gassed in front of them, um, and it was generally very brutal. They were placed in uh, Mauritius and the Seychelles, where they have had at the time no citizenship rights. They had no jobs. They had no housing. Um, and they were literally dropped and left. Um, so, uh, even less paid to um, the claims of the Shogosians in exile to return to the archipelago. Um, and those claims are there and they're very heartfelt. Um, so, the arguments for returning are based on a universal right to live and be at home. So, within the Shogosian view, Shogos is home. There is an inherent universal right to live there. Um, home is a term that we often use in international politics, but we don't often define or explore, as I've said. Um, and yeah, to me, that calls for, for further interrogation of what home does in global ordering. So I argue that the Chagos Archipelago is of global interest, not just because of the potential war crimes carried out there, um, but because the Chagossians, with no sovereign state claim or sovereign state historically of their own, are advancing a new form of international politics based on the right to be at home. Uh, this new international politics challenges the state as uh, the foundational unit of the global. 
um, in avoiding the sovereign claim of uh, both the UK and Mauritius over the islands. Um, in order to claim the Chalgossian right to return, the Chalgossians argue that home is more politically salient than the state and also international law based on the state. Uh, to demonstrate this, I'll explain uh, the situation in Chagos, then how Chagossians use home in global politics and what this means, how this creates a new ethical order of the international, um, and then the implications for, I think, the study of international relations. So, um, oh, it's meant to be, doesn't matter. Um, so the Chagos archipelago is the site of a battle between two sovereign claims, uh, that of Mauritius, whose territory included the uh, islands prior to independence, and that of the UK, who excised the islands uh, in exchange for Mauritian independence um, and turned them into the British Indian Ocean Territory um, in 1965. So the Chagossians were brought to the archipelago um, about 200 years ago under colonial slaving conditions um, and then removed between 1965 and 1971 as part of the clearing to create the military base. Um, they were deported to Mauritius and the Seychelles. Uh, which one? Okay, um, to give you some indication, Mauritius is here. So it's uh, over 2,000 kilometers away, which is quite far. Um, um, so the international implications of this case have thus far been kind of uh, confined to the existing mapping of the international. So they're very state based, they're very law based. Um, and they have examined law and how it uh, creates a, a kind of moral coding of the international and about whether or not law is able to fairly treat the Chagossians. But I think that the Chagossian political claim does something a bit more innovative than this. I think that it goes beyond the law. Um, you know, I think there are questions of um, post-colonial borders, the, the role of history in drawing these borders, the role of home in the post-colonial, um, the continuation of colonial borders in saying that Mauritius has a sovereign claim to these islands of these people that until they were deported to Mauritius never saw themselves as Mauritian. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of questions that echo across the international here. Um, and so looking at home um, as a political claim highlights the Chagossian claim to international subjectivity and to contestation in global politics. Uh, so how does home work to bring about the Chagossian struggle? Um, it calls upon both domestic and international legal regimes, ideas of what is proper to the state and then what is also proper to humanity, um, and an ethics based on avoiding harmful consequences in order to advance a vision of a global politics, and that includes political ontology, political teleology, and political normativity uh, that takes neither the state nor law as its ultimate aim or logic. So, the global envisioned by the Chagossians functions on a universal rule of respect for indigeneity at home. That is the absolute right of the indigenous to reside in their homeland. Uh, and all politics and all morality is then judged through this ultimate value. Um, the universal rule is read through its frustration in the case of the Chagossians. And I argue that this particular instantiation and its universal rule can usefully be termed a right to home. And that the political ontology advanced by the Chagossians is that of the home, where this home creates a space for the proper flourishing of those who are able to be at home there. I hope that makes sense. So it's home rather than the state that structures the globe. Uh, the key point here is that uh, mapping this right to home and its interactions with the conventional understandings of the state, sovereignty and international normativity shows that it advances a world different to the one that we currently occupy or different to the one that we may think that we currently occupy. There is an underlying layer of people calling upon home that is not hegemonic. Um, and it offers us not a new political imaginary of the global, but if we are able to retrieve these mappings, it offers us an alternative, right, that is already existing. Um, so I'll briefly talk you through the work on Chagos, sorry, I actually don't know. Um, to hopefully con convince you that home is an alternative political understanding of the global. Um, I personally use post-structuralist discourse analysis. Um, I'm not gonna talk you through what that means, but if you have any questions, let me know. Um, so I'll just share a few of my findings. And again, any questions, just ask. Uh, so the morality of home within this discourse is proven by the happiness, self-sufficiency and harmony that the Chagossians experienced while they were on the islands prior to their exile. The poverty and disharmony they experienced in exile are thus indicative of a fundamental dislocation and of a moral transgression. Um, 
it's for this reason that any difficulties that existed while they lived on the islands have to be obscured, right? Life on the island was perfect. Life after the island is unlivable, basically. Um, and that's because the moral claim to birthright is about sustaining humanity and being able to flourish at home and the inability to flourish anywhere else. So any difficulties cannot be admitted. Um, the good life can only be achieved when a person is living on their birthplace and uh, so life on the birthplace has to be perfect. Um, and the homeland is the only place in which a subject can flourish. Uh, on the other side of the coin, not being at home creates physical harm and is linked with illness. So the Shargossians have a concept called sovereign, which sort of captures this. It's this, uh, it's a literal homesickness. So it's a death um, or, I mean, quite often actually, actual death um, caused by homesickness. And it's attributed as a, as a medical cause for a lot of ex uh, yeah, deaths in exile of Shargossians. Um, so it's a proven inability to go on living without access to home, which functions as uh, proof both of the existence and of the legitimacy of a birthright claim to home within the discourse. Uh, there's a larger claim here that world politics should be one of sustaining life and well-being, and that is achieved through living at home of all people. Uh, I think this is something that seems fairly commonsensical, right? Like we go home to relax or to be ourselves or, you know, paint the walls a way that reflects us. So it feels like it makes sense that home should be somewhere that secures you as uh, as an identity, I suppose. Uh, so the particular struggle of Shargossians is linked through this uh, universal normative regime um, and then linked back to the Shargoss in particular. Um, and the logic of the right to live in one's birthplace is that there is a natural congruency between populations and their birthplace, and that this congruency is available to all except the Shargossians, right? So, their frustration is what proves this universal rule. Uh, the violation of the right creates physical harm, and thus there's like a naturalistic, consequentialist, ethical approach to the international here. Um, the legitimacy of Mauritian and British sovereignties are hierarchized according to their treatment of the Shargossians and the defense uh, of the right to return. They're also hierarchized through denial of citizenship to second and third generation Shargossians, uh, where the British deny second and third generation Shargossian citizenship and the Mauritians don't. Um, so this is despite the fact that Shargossians have a tense relationship with citizenship in other places. Um, oh, yeah, so the Mauritian sovereignty is placed as more sympathetic to this universal right to home than the British sovereignty is, which is why the Shargossians uh, side with Mauritius in international legal cases rather than with the British. Um, Yeah, so home and sovereignty are not the same here, right? Because sovereignty belongs to a state and it does not belong to home. Uh, so the naturalized normativity of home uh, is thus that being at home is the moral telos of the globe. All political legitimacy derives from it. This moral telos is proven by the undesirable consequences of exile. The legitimacy of the totalizing claims is read through how they play out in the Shalos in particular except the indigenous home claim, which is the ultimate guarantor and value of political normativity. Therefore, every claim, including those of the Shargossians, is subject to the moral telos of home. Human rights are subject to guaranteeing home. Indigenous claims to home are absolutely inalienable and therefore give all normative claims their meaning and position within normative hierarchy. So fulfillment of the indigenous claim to home is the ultimate moral end of global politics within this discourse. Right? So, Sovereignty and sovereign power are legitimate only insofar as they respect the moral telos of home via via the struggles in particular. So law is viewed as legitimate only insofar as it proceduralizes and guarantees the right to be at home. Shargossians have no claim to sovereignty and therefore must utilize the state when uh, actions that are reserved for states. Um, uh, when when those are required to challenge the illegitimate global. Um, because of their indigeneity and their intimate familiarity with the normativity of home and the pain of its frustration, Shargossians are placed as arbitrators of the global telos uh, of indigeneity at home. They are therefore legitimated in their critique of state, uh, sovereignty, and where necessary, law. Um, I'll finish very quickly, sorry. Uh, so it's true that the Shargossians were essentially dealt away with at the global poker table, but the question remains, how was this able to happen? Why is it that populations are able to be 
um, subject to a global politics of the state, right? Uh, and that, that seems obvious, right? Oh, states are the most important thing, but how did we get to that point? Um, why does the colonial map continue to delimit the po possibilities of international politics? Uh, these are like essential questions for international relations that a state-based um, theory can't come to terms with. Um, and this matters for studying international relations because reading outside of the state allows us to draw alternative maps of the global and to expand our imaginary of the future of global politics. It highlights that the state is a construction and therefore also open to deconstruction, especially where alternative forms are already being proposed, right? The globe is already full of alternatives. Uh, it's my contention that home is being mobilized as a claim to global legitimacy, power and moral standing against the hegemony of the state and sovereignty. So, uh, you know, what's at stake is that there's an entire level of uh, global politics functioning on home that is not visible to us through a state-based international relations. Um, and retrieving this um, is really important because there has been a recent rise in the use of home as a political uh, imaginary and understanding and argument. So you see it uh, in my three case studies, which are Tuvalu, Hawaii and Chagos. Um, I think you can see it in an awful lot of places, the role of home in politics. Um, so basically, my argument is that it's time for international relations to consider what it might be to find a home for itself. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Martin Silcock. I'm a first year PhD student in the Department of War Studies. So thank you for Rhiannon for inviting me to speak about your paper, which is fascinating, interesting, and has uh, enormous salience given the kind of many situations where home and its relationship to the international uh, in sites of conflict is of central importance. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time, hopefully less than 10 minutes, but I've, I've got a few questions. Um, the first thing I was quite curious about is how you see the Chagossians discourse dealing with this concept called home and you mentioned a sense in which home's commonsensical which perhaps implies an appeal to the idea of home that we all have as human individual human beings and that that, that concept's highly ambiguous so we're capable of lab labeling as home more than one place at the same time as uh, any emigre might be able to attest um, but it seems to me that what defines it in that personal sense is it's an effective concept, the way you feel about it, but also you're absolute right to name it, to label home as your home. Um, I wonder though, whether you might contrast that with the, that personal home idea with the concept of a homeland, um, which I think is similar, but not quite the same thing. I mean, I think it also has huge effective content for an individual, a homeland, um, but it has, quite diff of slightly different connotations in relation to its relationship to groups, what this means for the right to label by a group or an individual, relationship to indigeneity, which I'll come back to, perhaps its attachment to a particular territory, perhaps, or perhaps more, notion more notions of more permanence. And I was wondering if Chagossians appeal to both home and homeland concepts, and if they do, what aspects do they appeal, and or do they just and do they distinguish those two concepts or, or do they align them? Um, building on that, I was wondering in terms of discourse concept, what, what the Chagossian discourse is actually making the concept of home do. Uh, if I got it right, you're kind of arguing that their discourse is seeking to place home above sovereignty on the basis of an appeal to universal moral values. Um, but in doing so, I wondered if it's also trying to define what home means or what it is, or what homeland is. In other words, if home is currently a bit of an, what they, you know, we use jargon term, an empty signifier, then does the Chagossian discourse seek to fix its meaning, or is it definitively not trying to fix its meaning and using the ambiguity of the concept in some way to, to make its case? Or is it is it simply mobilizing, you know, a question of rights and ordering, if you like, in the hierarchy? So the international, I mean, in terms of home, the international has clearly engaged with and has mobilised concepts of home or homeland in the past, often in the context of, you know, fraught colonising or decolonising processes. Um, that engagement has concrete long term impacts, often with you know, enormous and adverse consequences for the affected peoples. I think one of the points I'm making is that those past events have helped constitute a global discourse in which the home is subordinate to sovereignty, 
But those past examples of the international's engagement show, uh, with home have resulted in people both gaining and regaining homes, as well as losing or being denied their, denied their homes. And given that history seems to confirm or produce that global discourse that we have, that, and that the Chagossians are kind of seeking to overturn, I was wondering to what extent, if they do, and, or, or if so, how mobilising the precedents that are provided or by, by the past engagement with the international and the idea of home. Um, last year, I was fortunate enough to hear Philippe Sands talk about his involvement in the legal case over many years, uh, which he's described in a, a recent book called The Last Colony, interestingly. Um, they're obviously mobilising, Chagossians are mobilising this course, I think, which makes thinkable that the law itself may be subservient to the moral claim of home, um, but also having to engage with that law at the same time to, 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 um, to, to make their case and that it, with current law and international legal institutions. I wonder if you had any thoughts about how political claims are being mobilised into an effective legal strategy, given that they are kind of in some sense contesting the law itself. I said I'd return to indigeneity. Um, it's quite interesting that the Jugossians were kind of brought to their home. Uh, these are the Chagos Islands about two or three hundred years ago, I think it was, by a colonial action as slaves. So um, I think I'm right in saying that it was a previously uninhabited land, so they were de de definitively the first humans to live on it, but they came from somewhere else. Um, and that seems to me to indicate that indigeneity is quite a kind of also quite an ambiguous concept, and it, it causes you to ask questions about what it, indigeneity actually means. Yes, Sorry, I'm nearly finished today. I just want, and I wondered if the Chagossian sort of engage with how what indigeneity is and how they kind of fold that into the into the way they're making their discourse. Um, yeah, so. A few questions, I will stop there. Um, thank you very much, it was super interesting, so. Thank you. Questions that I'm grappling with as I write the thesis. Um, this home, homeland thing, I think it's one of the most interesting. So within the Chagossian discourse, they talk about the land and the practices that the land allows them to do. So those practices are what make indigeneity. Indigeneity understandable. Um, so in performing the indigenous uh, identity, it is the practices that are enabled by the land that make those possible. And home partially functions on this uh, indigenous identity, but it also doesn't completely. So um, they actually don't really talk about homeland. And what's interesting for me about the idea of homeland is that we talk about it constantly, right? Like if you have done international relations at university for any length of time, homeland comes up all the time. And no one ever really talks about what it means for home to be part of that word. So we understand, right, that there's a kind of blood and soil tie to homeland. It feels very nationalist. But what does it mean if home is then performing some sort of ontologically securing uh, function, right? Or is it doing that? If we can have multiple homes, then how ontologically securing is one home? But is there a difference between having multiple homes and being entirely homeless, right? Are those two different um, states of security? Right? And is having multiple homes less secure than having one home? I, my argument is that home means very different things in very different contexts but that it's really important that we look at what it does rather than just take it for granted. So it's present in the idea of homeland. Cool, right? Everyone knows that. Everyone sort of has an instinctive idea of what that means. But what does it actually mean? What things does it legitimise about a homeland? And what things does it legitimise about a state predicated on the idea of a homeland to call the people at homeland? Um, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question, but I think it's, it, it moves somewhere towards it. Um, and then, yeah, how does home function, I guess, is related to that. So, yes, I do view it as an empty signifier. It's something that never has to justify itself because it's such a huge part of the underpinning discourse. So we assume that we know what it means. Um, and that's why investigating it is interesting. Um, 
and it's filled with all sorts of things from all sorts of different places. But I think the important thing is that those discourses that seek to drag it out and name it, whether they're emancipatory or less emancipatory, which I think home definitely doesn't have a fixed politics. It is something that can be used for many ends. Um, it, what's important is that someone has recognised that it's a fundamental structuring idea within the international and that to draw it out is to be able to make a claim on that international, that it can't deny because it knows that home is a fundamental claim but that it has not yet been able to recognize, right? So that's why it's subversive, that's why it works, because it draws on something that is already present within that international discourse. Um, oh, the instrumentalization thing I think is interesting. I think there is definitely, um, you know, there are always practical considerations on a discourse, right? Like material or ideological structures fundamentally shape what we do in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Fundamentally, they interact with what we do in some way. Um, and so constructing effective legal strategies is necessary and they are part of building this discourse. I think that what's interesting is when you look at the extra legal um, narratives that are going on, right? So like you look at those protests outside the Royal Courts of Justice. They're not about the very specific legal ongoings within those legal cases. They're about the right to live at home, right? They're very effective, uh, effective and feelings-based, um, but they also draw upon something that is seen as collectively understood, right? Home is something that we all have some sort of effective attachment to. Um, and I think that effective structure is, is really fascinating. Um, and then, yeah, the role of indigeneity, I think is a complex one. Um, obviously. Um, it's very interesting, David Vine has a very, very comprehensive report, I think it's about 300 pages, on uh, proving that the Shogossians meet uh, something like 17 out of 18 internationally recognised criterion of indigeneity. Um, I personally think that that is, it's an interesting project, right, and it's interesting to know what the structures internationally are. I think that indigeneity is much more slippery than that. I think we have to look at it as a politically constructed term rather than a legally or, or scholarly term. Um, but I do think it does interesting work. And I think the way in which home, I think homeland especially, constructs a sense of primordial identity relates to indigeneity. And I think the ways in which indigeneity can be um, reactionary in some ways. Um, so thank you, Toto. We've got a question um, from Elizabeth Brown in the, the chat. Does anybody have questions in the room just, just for managing time? OK, so I think if we take the question online and then and then your question, and then um, I suspect, unfortunately, we will have to, to, to move on to the next speaker. So Elizabeth says, you've spoken a lot about the moral imperatives which are involved with the issues you're studying. I'm curious whether the realities of the Chagossians' arrival and in Chagos have played a role as well, i.e. these people perhaps even more deserving than others having a home because this isn't the first time they've been removed from there. So do you want to just take that question and then we'll... Yeah. Um, so I think there definitely is, um, yeah, a lot of truth to that idea. I think this idea of having been forcibly removed from a home does create this, um, this kind of moral imperative. And I think it, it is stronger if it's... Um, not, not so, I think I, I'm curious about the narrative um, I think perhaps it does, but I also think that actually the Chagossians do view themselves as victims of colonial crime, right, which they 1000% are. Their placement on the island was a crime, but I think the fact that it allowed them to develop the community and the home and the identity that they have is not seen as a kind of double betrayal. I think it's seen as part of the structure of the British uh, state's immorality, right? So the British state proves itself to be immoral by conducting colonial slavery. Uh, and then, oh yeah, look, the British state is still immoral. It removes us from our homes. Um, 
because the state, the British state, is inherently um, unable to respect Indigenous home. I think that is that's the broader structure of that um, that kind of setting. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Great. Okay, thank you. Do you want to just sort of introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name's Fred. I'm a second year history and I am student at King's. Uh, thank you, fellow. It's really insightful, especially about identity. I kind of want to ask in the sense of the role of humanitarian interventions and stuff. Does that, do you think that does, does and particularly military interventions, do you think that when they cite, obviously, just war reasons and they cite it for the protection of identity and thing, do you think that actually diminishes the concept of home or, does, or perhaps it improves it in the sense of of a broader scheme, if that makes sense? Um, I think it depends what you're looking at it from, right? Obviously, as an international framework, I suppose if you're talking about home in terms of structuring military intervention, then yes, that bolsters that as a kind of discursive structure. But if you are looking at a military intervention that has destroyed the physicality of your home, then what you're looking at actually is the way in which a discourse of home operates to cover up um, power politics, right? So the idea is that home here still has a legitimacy, but that it is used, that legitimacy is used then to justify things that aren't necessarily in the protection of all homes in the same way that kind of broadly justice or liberal international order might be. Um, and so I think that's that's why I think home is so interesting because it it can fulfil that function quite usefully, but it can also be turned the other way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We got any? Have we got any more questions for Rhiannon? I'm apologies to everybody um, online. The cam the, the 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 camera is uh, is not amazing, and I'm having to hold it in order to to actually get a view of the speakers. So it's gonna it's gonna move a few times. I'm sorry about that. Um, so have we got any more questions online or from um, yeah uh, one, one yeah? Quick question. You mentioned you use post structuralist discourse analysis. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of intellectual resources from post structuralist uh, literature? Yeah, totally. So I um, do fairly. I'm going to say fairly straightforward Foucauldian discourse analysis. I, I view discourse um, as something that already exists. It is an event. It like is something that we can investigate. Um, so for the Shogosian case, that means that I look at uh, the existing speeches of Olivier Bancourt, who is the kind of major legal and uh, social leader of the Shogosians in exile. He's a Mauritian um, and a Brit, actually. He's, he's really to obviously in first, right, but he has those two citizenships. Um, and I look at the way in which the things he says either contradict themselves or they seem to adhere to something whilst also adhering to something else, right? So there's a really interesting interview with him where the interviewer um, is Mauritian and they're quite, they're having quite a go at him. Right. They're like, yeah, but you're Mauritian, right? You're Mauritian. So why do you not want Chagos to be Mauritian? And he's like, look, I'm perfectly happy for Chagos to be Mauritian for now. But like, why shouldn't Chagos be a country? And like, to me, that question is so interesting because it reveals a fundamental questioning of what makes a country. Right. Why should Chagos not be a country? And so it's about. Um, it's about reading inside the text, right? You're not allowed to read outside the text, but it's about realising how many investments there are within that text that only reveal themselves when you really look at them. I don't know if that's like a terrible explanation of post-structuralist discourse analysis, but um, it's about it's about looking for things that when you crack them open reveal lots to you. Um, which I guess all these classes is, but it's not really the tool that I use. Great. Thank you, Rhiannon, so much for a fascinating talk. It's a fascinating subject um, and a really different, gives us a really different way of thinking about some, um, some of the kind of really important questions in such relations. So thank you so much, Rhiannon. Um, Pauline, yeah. uh, over to you. Yeah. If you'd like to. It actually, what I'm working on ties 
rather surprisingly, if not um, sadly nicely into what you're doing, um, which is this idea of um, that there might be a contestation over existing homes, but in the future with climate change, there will definitely be a contestation over the availability of future homes. Um, and though my research doesn't explicitly focus on, on the homeland or connections to land, what it does a bit more specifically is ask why both the international relations discipline, but also political actors haven't mobilized action in the way that we know science asks us to. Um, so first of all, climate change is both a product of our way of organizing life, international politics and our socioeconomic systems is a symbol of something inherently dysfunctional, but it also defies any sort of rationalist logic, right? The rationalist logic is um, bad stuff happens, we learn more about it, collect empirical evidence, and then we can improve. And then that bad stuff doesn't happen that much longer. We know obviously from um, not just research on climate change, but any sort of inequality that that logic doesn't really apply to the international system. And to be honest, I also don't want to spend too much time on that rationalist logic because I think it's inherently flawed. But nevertheless, what the international relations discipline has not been able to grapple with is that sense of inaction. Why do actors fail to act? And that is one of the kind of core questions that I'm trying to answer in the specific paper that I'm currently working on. And there are explanations for inaction, but I'm trying to uncover the mechanism of inaction, which I say is a bit different to the explanation for inaction. So if we're looking at explanations for inaction in the broader literature, in terms of international relations literature, though sending it out in 2019 or 20, um, estimated that 0.76% of the international relations literature in one way or another features climate change. So um, there is not that much to work with, um, but from the international relations literature on climate change, as well as broader literatures in international political economy, there are multiple competing explanations as to inaction. So that can be the collective action problem as one of the explanations of inaction, um, which basically means that in principle, states have an interest in a stable climate, but also have an interest in free riding off the um, improvements and concerns of others. Um, though Acklin and Mildenberger say there is no actually convincing empirical evidence for the collective action problem, they call it the prisoners of a wrong dilemma. Um, when you substitute that explanatory hypothesis with um, distributive conflict. So they say anything that can be explained by the collective action problem can be better explained by the possibility of distribution or conflict. And then there are others who have power based explanations for inaction, so vested interests, the fossil fuel industry, la di da di da di da. And then there are yet others who say there is a kind of pragmatism or incrementalism with our resistance to change, that change doesn't really happen in response to the incremental every day, but rather in response to crises. Um, and that then led me on to ask about how is change explained in the international relations literature more broadly? And there are multiple or competing explanations as to why change happens. Um, one of them is a sort of change can happen more as a product of progressivism or um, some sort of slow but um, kind of moving forward progress, which is what we're talking about in terms of the rationalist logic. Then there's a sort of um, episodic or rather cyclical notion of history happens in patterns, a great powers decline and rise and somehow change is implicated within that. And then there's a third element of episodism. So something happens, a big crisis happens, and that's how change manifests. And my, to actually get to what my paper is about, my paper asks, but what happens if actors, as Whitmire and I'll call it, argue that there is a necessity for change in response to a crisis and intersubjectively across a community of people within a country 
there is agreement and consensus that change is needed in response to a crisis, but that change doesn't manifest or that change is not being implemented. Why does that happen? Very often narrative literature, for example, says, well, the narrative changes and when the narrative changes, stuff will happen afterwards. In the context of climate change, that doesn't happen. In fact, the disparity between narrative and action is increasing as ambitions are rising, great, but also as inaction keeps furthering the problem that we have. And I say this kind of mechanism of inaction is embedded by us and how we respond to energy crisis in particular, which is what I'm looking at, but it can be any climate crisis that you would be looking at. And I say that this mechanism of inaction is the choice and set of routines that we invoke in response to energy crisis. Um, and that is firstly because climate change and energy crisis are often dislocated from each other. So there is an energy crisis and energy insecurity is characterized as the shortage of fossil fuel supply. Um, and therefore the short term, in quotation mark, energy security response is to fill up the shortage of this energy security insecurity through fossil fuel supply and more fossil fuel supply. What happens as a consequence of that short term response is, however, an implementation of a fossil fuel routine that serves as a long term infrastructure investment. Um, whereas what is not happening is a kind of invocation of climate routines. And I'm explaining that um, in this article that I'm working on um, as through a case study of Germany's energy security response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I'm saying that what happened in the context of German policymakers in response to this energy crisis was a sort of temporal and spatial displacement or dislodging of climate as a problem that's exogenous to the energy security crisis. So the energy security crisis was characterized as a gas crisis, shortage of supply, um, we need to diversify gas supply, we need to build our own gas infrastructure, um, and we need to do this very quickly and immediately and now. Also, climate change is a problem that happens in the future, and yes, we need to address that, so you temporarily and spatially displace it, so your crisis response routine doesn't really work at all in reference to your climate routine. And that sort of discrepancy needs to be politically explained and expressed, and I'm saying that happens through temporally scaling, or rather prioritizing different temporal scales. Benoit Pelupida explains a similar mechanism for, in his book called The Birth of Nuclear Eternity, where you're so long justifying your short-term routines, but they are actually manifesting then as long-term infrastructures and long-term possibilities, where you, whereas you disclose or forego the possibility of democratically opening short-term responses to crises. And he says that just means that in the context of nuclear um, weapons, that just means there's a continuous promise as to a possibility of a future without, but whatever you're enacting now implements the impossibility of a kind of without nuclear weapon future. And that then perpetuates a continued logic of how we respond to crises. And by dislodging those kind of climate routines we are also treating the incumbent fossil fuel identity as um, hierarchically superior to a sort of climate identity, if you wish, whatever that looks like. But it also then means that we are increasing the price and we're increasing the kind of delay to climate action proving itself, right? We're doing two things here. We're not just saying, um, we're not just making climate action more expensive. We're also delaying the benefits of climate action as they would present themselves to citizens. And therefore, in response, criticisms being probably more critical. At the same time, we're confusing the source of the energy crisis. In most of the energy um, security concerns that German policymakers raised, they considered the Russian economic war, the Russian attack, the Russian um, kind of 
uh, energy uh, warfare and the conduct of that as the exogenous problem and the source of the crisis. Not once did the discourse turn to a the endogenous fossil fuel dependency as the source of crisis. And by dislocating that source of crisis from your own dependency on fossil fuels, you're making it almost impossible to enact short term and long term climate routines in response to that. And so my takeaway is that in this kind of explanation of the temporal politics of routines and how you're justifying and articulating your routines, we're doing something that is normatively kind of um, building the incumbent fossil fuel identity. And within that, I'm also challenging some of the more, um, some of the literature that sees routines always as an automatic process that just happens, unreflective, automized in response to crisis. We're kind of routine animals. And I'm saying we are actually not, we, we use a lot of critical thinking in deploying routines. If you're thinking about which way to walk to work, for example, say you have three ways to walk to work, you're doing a lot of calculation. You might pull up Google Maps, you might think, be thinking about which routine am I going to draw on today? Am I going to take the tube? Am I not? That's a lot of critical thinking skills. And I'm saying that in which routines we're invoking at which time scales in response to crisis, there's actually a lot of agency by far away from automatic behavior and a lot more agency of political actors involved in this process, which then is inherently linked to the power politics or a lot of the other explanations that we've seen for inaction. I'm going to end that here. Um, over to Rose. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name's Rob, um, a uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the Centre for Grand Strategy, my colleague at Pauline's. Um, I work on, I guess, questions of world order and great power competition in a 21st century, which is marked by climate change. This interesting research is super germane to the stuff that I've been doing as well. So thanks very much for this opportunity to uh, read this paper for the second time, actually. Um, I really enjoyed it and I feel like I learned a lot. Um, it's really pushed me to I guess, think about climate change from new angles, particularly the temporal angle, the time angle, which I really, I think I don't do enough. And so it's something that I find really interesting to, to sort of learn more about. Um, I really like the point that you made about uh, how attempts to secure energy independence, like within the paper itself, attempts to secure energy independence, um, how they also produce forms of insecurity over the long term, um, which is paradoxically based on this kind of this strange dependence on others. So we, we're looking for energy independence through fossil fuels, but we also end up somehow also being dependent on others through that. Um, I think this is really true. Um, it's something that states and people have begun to wake up to, but it's really like strange how we still haven't been able to break away from that fully. And I think one of the things this paper does is really nicely show the mechanism uh, sort of through which, which that happens. Um, and I also really liked how you articulated this link between, I guess, hegemonic interests um, and how they're enshrined through these routinized practices. So we get very caught up often, I think, in our big denunciations of the bad politics and the bad thinking that goes on. And we often forget to look at how this kind of plays out, the actual mechanism through which it occurs. Um, so I guess I have four uh, questions or clusters of questions or challenges, um, which I think is quite a lot. So feel free to kind of synthesize or ignore them as you see fit. Um, the first concerns these routines that you spoke about. So you, I think you really nicely outlined in the paper what you think their effects are, but I'm still kind of wondering what is a routine um, for you? And, you know, and, and who, who does them? Um, is it states, state bureaucracies? Is it companies? Is it people? Um, and you also talk a bit about the performativity of routines. And I was wondering, okay, cool. Who are they being performed for? So who's the audience of the routine? Um, and also, what distinguishes routines from actions? And if I was, if I was conceptually hostile to this work, which I'm not, I should reiterate. But if I was, um, I would probably say something like, "Okay, well, the decision to, you know, reinvest in fossil fuels in this crisis context, that's an action. Is it really a routine?" So I was wondering if you could kind of distinguish between um, those things. So that's one thing: routines. Who are they? What What are they for? Who does them? So. The second um, concerns, I guess, this question of time and temporality. And I'm just wondering if you could tease out a bit more 
what you think about the relationship is between time and security um, in the context of climate change. Is it, do you think that it's that climate change sort of collapses some of these understandings about a linear progression around time? Or does the problem of time and climate sort of emerge in the way that time is constructed and represented by these various actors which you identify? So that's the second um, question set. The third, I think you sort of mentioned it a bit in the presentation, but you also talk about fossil fuel identities. Um, and it comes on quite strongly at the start of the piece, but then it sort of diminishes as the piece goes on. And I was wondering if you can sort of explain a bit more about what you think these are, these fossil fuel identities, and how they're embodied in these routines. Um, and in the final final sort of question, which is about your broader kind of contribution, and you kind of you did speak about this actually in the presentation, but um, it was really clear in the paper what you're trying to do normatively, which is you know call attention to these kind of perverse ways that um, we construct um, relationships between security and energy in the contract, or separate them as it were, um, in the context of climate change. But you also signaled this kind of theoretical contribution, which I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, particularly this. Um, strategic ontology concept that you were sort of throwing around in there. And I'm just wondering how this works in the context of broader debates around energy security. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Really enjoyed the paper. Look forward to hearing your response. Uh, I will say that the paper, as it looks currently, I got a um, uh, major revision from the journal I sent it to. So, it currently looks entirely different to what you've read. Um, with <laughs> in part uh, speaks to some of those elements that you were just outlining. Uh, first of all, my contribution to academic scholarship is in part, mostly in fact, driven by a sort of deep frustration with how things are. I think um, if I weren't an academic, I would probably just run around <laughs> the entire time being outraged at everything that's happening. But really trying to understand this inherent paradox is that the longer we wait, the more expensive it will be to sort that out and the more impossible it becomes. But also, all the economics are already clear. The, 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 it, it, there is so much illogical and discrepant and dissonant kind of politics around climate change that I'm really not or initially found very difficult to understand. We know they're estimated to be around 12 trillion in net savings if we reach um, net zero by 2050, according to the IEA, which is by far a progressive um, agency or historically has not been a very progressive agency. So those are quite conservative estimates. We also know that in a lot of the explanations for reaching net zero, this idea of oh, be very capital intensive now and later we'll pay out, but we don't have the cash to do this now. We're already investing a lot in austerity politics. That's costing us, us a lot. The publics have accepted that to some degree post-2008 um, with the promise that this would pay out, but it hasn't paid out. So why is there such a resistance to this investment um, in climate change policies? Uh, the contribution therefore theoretically is that I think all the explanations for inaction are valid, but how do states justify this dissonance when it goes contrary to either their security interests or, in fact, any sort of responsibility? So I'm trying to link or bridge that gap between um, what some call normative scholarship and sort of a rationalist or um, some sort of um, sci social sciences approach to things. And I'm saying there is no distinction between normative scholarship in that way. Um, towards other social sciences, and any scholarship is normative, and all of those explanations are rooted in mechanisms that foster that justification for the insecurity that is perpetuated. Likewise, I'm trying to challenge this idea of, or the, what the paper was originally called, is a, um, the politics of maladaptive routines. So I'm trying to create um, a better theoretic sense of the maladaptive politics that we're creating by continuing to invest in something that's causing our own insecurity. And that's something deeply political because it's actually not just our own insecurity, but in the context of climate change, any domestic decision is a foreign political choice, as I always say. Um, and within that context, we are also 
not just fostering our own insecurity, but for um, populations in, for example, small island nations, they are also saying you have no right to live. It's not just a right to home even, it's a right to exist. And within that context, I'm trying to formulate how we can leverage accountability, not just against the narratives that are being deployed, i.e. ambition, but also the actions that are being taken. Long-winded way of saying, um, what are fossil fuel identities? Um, I think I link that actually to routines. I think action and routine aren't so far distinguished by how often they're replicated um, within their mechanism. So an action can, in that sense, be just a response to something. It doesn't yet have to be routine. I think routine and time connect as in so far as their actions being continuously or frequently taken to secure a certain identity. So a fossil fuel identity in that way is permeated by actions that are routinely done through time that foster or connect a sense of identity to the source of that identity, which is fossil fuels. Um, links back to the theoretical contribution that is kind of the big picture research I'm trying to do, which is conceptually our understanding of political power in the international system is so deeply connected to the materiality of fossil fuels that once we remove that materiality of fossil fuels, we have no sense of what political power is actually outside of a fossil fuel power. Mm. Um, and I'm quite interested in figuring out what alternative conceptualizations of power are in that, in that future. Um, or that's at least, fingers crossed, some of what I want to think about in my book. And um, lastly, what are routines? And um, you helpfully in reviewing my paper initially uh, pointed me to um, Eden, who looks at organizational routines versus frames. Um, I think frames are ways of perceiving a problem that you leverage solutions at and that you perceive to be within the scope of your agency and um, to respond to. Um, Brent Steele argues that one of the inherent vulnerabilities of the aesthetic self that the state sees, seeks to express is that it needs to see itself play out in action. So routines are one mechanism of doing that. Um, but as others have documented, just because you're acting doesn't actually mean you're doing anything substantively helpful. Um, so um, I think Lee points to states just creating fantasy documents. But you also actually see this in, um, in some of, um, I'm a huge uh, critic of consultancy companies, but you're seeing this a lot in consulting companies as well. There's a production of stuff that isn't necessarily substantive, right? So there's a kind of routine mechanism, seeing yourself in action that seeks to validate your own actions um, and your own sense of self, but realistically it doesn't really do anything substantive other than that kind of connection to your identity. Um, yeah, I think that's that. Oh, the time and security relationship. What does time, uh, climate change do to time? A multiple, connections there. So on the one hand, routine and time are intimately connected because they play out through time. The other is that um, climate change and the increasing likelihood of crises will fully collapse our understanding of time, what matters, what doesn't matter. But there's also an inherent politics of time, who has time to live, but also how are we accountable for future generations? And whose future are we enabling versus whose future we are not? There's also something so paradox about climate change, which I would love someone to do some research on. Might be me. I did not, but you're a little encouraged to do that. Um, which is that a lot of resistance to climate change politics are by those that don't have much time. Whereas a lot of hope for climate change politics are by those who argue they don't have more time. So there is actually a consultation over whose time matters politically and whose time request we are responding to politically that I think is quite powerful. Yeah. Right, do we, um, Colin, I know you said you, you took two, is that right? So yeah. what time do you, 
Five two. Five two. Okay, so I think we've probably got time for a couple of questions. So yes, if you just introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Uh, I'm Kevin Thursday. I'm Christian. I am. My research is completely different to climate change. It's not very close to me, and so sorry about maybe she said the militants question, but we all know politicians. Um, taking actions, um, mainly their actions depend on societies. Um, unfortunately, not many people believe climate change. Scientists believe, some of them still are doing. So, um, we criticize politicians for many things. One of them is they are taking actions, but their actions mainly depend on society's uh, ideas, what the government need to do. So how much your work influences society, and not just politicians, in maybe can convince politicians, you can convince society. So, on the other hand, society has some kind of uh, ideas about, okay, we understand um, some men made um, climate problems, affects climate change, but we still have had climate change centuries ago and so on and so forth. But for example, if I can't use pesticides and if I can't have this uh, farming, uh, uh, which also affects climate change. Many people will die because we don't have, I mean, population race quite rapidly and um, doing something on your soil backside your house. It's not enough to survive. So how you can convince those, those people who don't believe much about climate change, man-made climate change, and uh, is your work just for communist politicians and not communist society, which politicians reaction mainly depends on society's needs and social needs. No, good. I fundamentally believe that politicians don't just react to society. I think they react to fractions within societies that they consider electorally valuable. Yeah. But I also think there is another inverse relationship where politicians steer society or discourses within society that is quite important in the context of climate change. Um, I think the interesting thing here is that we see often um, climate politics being politicized and mobilized despite an overall consensus that more needs to be done. At least, for example, in the UK, we have around two thirds of the UK um, populace who largely agree with the notion that more needs to be done. And we have a very um, regressive and aggressive anti-climate change politics being perpetuated by the UK government at the moment that doesn't actually reflect the overall two-third-ish consensus. So I think there is something around the accountability element, but also who are you doing politics for that matters in this context. And then my dad is a farmer, so he and I have a lot of difficult conversations <laughs> about the politics. And we have a lot of difficult conversation about the distributional effect of the politics of climate change. But this is also something that I think is fundamentally the responsibility of governments. And frankly, I don't think the only way you don't believe in climate change is by closing your eyes, um, cl closing off your ears, and by sitting in a cellar. So either 
you reject the notion of climate change as in so far that you are completely close to the world around you. And secondly, it's spatially and temporarily displacing it because people are already experiencing it. You don't need to believe it in order to experience climate change. The fact that it is hotter in London over the summer months, but likewise for populations who are already being displaced or in Bangladesh who are experiencing the floods, couldn't care less about people who don't believe in climate change right. because they're experiencing it, right? So how can you make people believe? I wouldn't consider my dad a hardcore climate change denier, but he's very much like we need to feed and therefore these systems need to be in place that have always been in place. So there's a resistance to change that I hear in him. But the thing we can agree on is kind of land principles, so sort, of, sort of some sense of taking care of land. Um, there's also somehow a connection to conservational values that are in some way um, able to bridge a divide to climate deniers. Um, <clears throat> frankly, I think the way to convince the hardcore climate deniers is maybe you don't convince them, but at least go and make politics for them. And the way you make politics for people is, first of all, don't tax subsistence emissions, start taxing luxury emissions. I keep saying that there's a lot of um, politics around taxation. We tax a lot of subsistence emissions, which the poorest in a society will feel most, um, whereas the problem is often with luxury emissions. Having a third car should be expensive rather than driving a car somewhere in rural England, right? So there's discrepancy of taxation, that's the problem. And then again, let the positive effects of climate action be felt. You can't make them felt if you don't actually do the politics around it. Um, electricity would have been significantly cheaper if countries had already invested in a renewable energy share. They would have been less susceptible to the price volatility of fossil fuels. And ultimately, if you're yearning for politics of stability, that politics is not in the politics of fossil fuels in the future. Thank you so much. I think it's very convincing if you say electricity will be cheaper for you and yeah. it does these kind of things. But maybe if they can say, okay, it's cheaper for me here if I invest in the UK, but why I should invest somewhere in India or in uh in Middle East or uh, in Africa, what benefit I could have as a uh, taxpayer in the UK? Why I should uh, ask my government to go and invest there? Uh, what makes cheaper for me? Electricity is here in my home, but in the UK. So, how you can convince this kind of factions? And they can tell him also, okay, we can, we see this is a uh, situation. That Bangladesh people face, people in the uh, UK, but climate has been changing uh, historically. Lots of plants we are flooding. They are not. Uh, there are no any species anymore there, and so on and so forth. And it's a natural thing. They believe. So how can you make their mind changing and believe these different things? I mean, I'm not on a because we need to convince people. I want to my work. I I think more about people to change their ideas. What should be valued more? Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to. Yeah, sorry about this. <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, I'm not on a mission to convince, in the sense that I think. Trying to convince her something so desperate about it. What I am trying instead to do is show that some of the assumptions that we have about stability, well being, politics itself are so rooted in fossil fuels that we can't even conceive of. I think Andreas Malm stole it from someone, I don't know who. But we are better positioned to imagine the end of the world than we are to position to imagine the end of fossil fuels. 
and that's the absurdity we are um, that's the absurdity of the politics we're facing currently so i want to be more hopeful in the sense that cool if we are not able to imagine the end of fossil fuel let's let's do that and in that imagination there are a lot of catastrophic consequences for at least how climate denial is envisaged. But if you look at their actual grievances, then that's a grievance of loss around livelihood, the daily cost of living, prices, um, um, intermingled with, of course, racism and class um, communities and kind of superior superiority complexes and a lot of stuff that's really difficult to undo. But ultimately, it's a grievance. And I think a lot of positive imaginations of a post-fossil fuel world would actually address those grievances way more than in austerity politics or um, class what wars or racism will be able to. Morning, late for a teacher. Yeah. I just said uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, please join me. No, no, thank you. Two absolutely fascinating papers asking some really important questions, um, particularly around change in in two very different ways. But actually, there were, there were some interesting commonalities I think emerging yeah. as, as you develop. So uh, yeah, thank you to everybody for coming.